Um, Northwest Coast art occupies an important position in American uh, artistic traditions, and it also plays an important role in uh, maintaining the cultural diversity of the nation and the cultural survival of the region's uh, indigenous population. Uh, SHI, Sea Alaska Heritage Institute's vision is to establish Juneau as the Northwest Coast Arts Capital as the economic uh, engine for the region. We are also promoting the designation of Northwest Coast Arts as a national treasure, uh, just as jazz was declared a national treasure, and uh, the process is ongoing to declare blues also as a uh, national treasure. Uh, we began our, our efforts with the construction of the Walter Soboloff Building uh, that in itself is a work of art. The building itself is, is, is um, artistic. I know a lot of you from Juneau you know, can appreciate the aesthetics of the Walter Soboloff Building, uh, particularly when we contrast it to uh, other buildings that are supposedly uh, representative uh, of the mining era. And, and deco art, they call it deco art. And it became a struggle for us uh, when we wanted to build this design, this building, because it didn't conform to the mining architecture uh, or the deco art. I just could not believe that. Uh, and so we ended up having to go to the assembly uh, to get an exception so that we, the first peoples of this land, were able to design and build our own traditional architecture. But we also wanted to show um, it that our, our art, our culture is grounded in our ancient history, but also we wanted to show that our modernity and our movement uh, towards the future. So part of our effort uh, includes the training of art teachers about Northwest Coast art. And uh, our, our desire is to integrate it into the schools just as, as we have done and are doing in integrating our culture and our language into the schools. Now we are on a massive effort to introduce our arts into uh, the schools. So we are teaching teachers about Northwest Coast art, but in addition to that, we know that it's important for teachers to understand the cultural context of our Northwest Coast arts the policies um, on the sale of Northwest Coast arts and the laws surrounding the sale of Indian art and also cultural appropriation. Our policy, SHI's policy, calls for the recognition and the respect of traditional property laws and compliance with traditional practices that validate and respect clan ownership of crests, names, stories, songs, and other cultural and intellectual property. Clans can commission artists to make objects with their clan crests, but the artists are not allowed to sell and produce these clan crests. They're not allowed to produce it and sell it in the open art market. However, artists can produce designs using generic uh, form line designs depicting the eagle, raven, salmon, whales, bears, etc., et or basic form line designs such as ovoids and trigons on products that are made for sale in the open market. So in this photo you see uh, two designs. On the, um, on the left hand side you see a, a sockeye salmon uh, that's within an ovoid. This is an example of a clan crest owned by the Sukahadi. And this, this, this clan crest talks about two young boys that were taken by the Sakai salmon in Chilkoot Lake. That, they have the stories, they have the songs, we have the geographic site. Those are, all, those are clan properties. That cannot be copied and sold on the open market. It can only be sold to uh, and used only by uh, clan members of the Sukahadi unless they grant use rights, like I have been granted a use right to the Sakai as a child of the Sakai. The, uh, the Sakai on the left hand side is a generic, what we call a generic uh, Sakai 
that can be used, sold uh, on the open market. So in order to maintain the quality and, and integrity of Northwest Coast art, SHI is encouraging individuals or entities that plan to use Northwest Coast Arts design to utilize Northwest Coast artists to ensure that designs comply with Northwest Coast art designs and rules. I've said that our art evolved over a 4,000 year period. It has very distinctive rules that governs and the rules about the shape itself. This is Robert Davidson and, uh, and he's teaching and he says, and, and my granddaughter is actually uh, uh, training with him as an apprentice. And one of her uh, assignments is to make 10,000 ovoids. And he says, by the time you've made 10,000 ovoids, you should have mastered making ovoids. So, uh, and we know that there's a lot of poor art that is out there. Uh, we're trying to teach people about what is good Northwest Coast art because uh, we want to maintain the integrity of the art. When Robert Davidson told me that our art was deteriorating, I got hysterical. And I said, well, I'm going to run down to Santa Fe and establish a Northwest Coast Arts degree program. And he said, no way. He says, you have to go into the villages and start teaching basic form line. So that's what we've been doing is going into, into our villages, teaching, um, uh, having workshops, just teaching form line designs. The interesting thing that's happened though is now you're seeing a lot of just form line design artwork. That, that came as a result of just teaching basic, what basic form lines are, what the components are. So you're seeing a lot of that on uh, on different art, on regalia now. That, that's a consequence. Whenever you make a change, you can always expect that there's going to be some follow-up, some subsequent change, and that's what we're, we're seeing. Under our laws, uh, uh, clan, uh, clan ownership also applies to songs and stories, uh, and we keep harping and harping on this, that dance groups can sing clan songs if they have members of their dance group that are members of a clan, or if they have been granted a use right to sing a song, but they always have to acknowledge uh, the clan that owns the songs. Uh, the same applies to the oral traditions. Um, in plays on, uh, based on oral traditions, um, we had to go to our Council of Traditional Scholars and say, this is something that we wanted to do. They said, no, you can't do it because it, um, it's owned by clans. So what we did was we, we selected stories that were owned by multiple tribes and multiple clans. But then we came into uh, conflict with, with the script writers because the script writer says, under American law, I would own copyright to a play that I wrote. So we ended up uh, in a compromise. And, and this is what, you ha what has to happen when you have two cultural traditions that are meeting and you want bo both of them want to survive. And but one is dominant, one is not, not dominant. But we uh, came to a compromise where we agreed that we would hold joint copyright between, it was SHI on behalf of the clans and also the copyright. But we insisted in the contract that the copyright, that the playwright would have to come to us and say this is where, uh, where we're going to uh, produce this play. We didn't want them to hold it in a culturally in inappropriate place. So, um, so it's been working out fine for us. Uh, I wanted to add in there that um, we have these laws about the application of oral traditions, but you, uh, we also have to be careful that it doesn't violate the uh, cultural norms. Uh, for example, you can't uh, be using uh, our, our people can't participate in theatrical performances if, uh, if they're still in mourning. Or uh, another thing, when we were starting to teach Clinkett uh, in the schools, we found that people were taking some of our, the speeches that we had recorded and transcribed and were teaching around these, uh, these speeches. But what happens is when these speeches are, are made, they're calling on the spirits that they reference in their speech. And so remember, you have to have social spiritual balance. So we say you can't do that unless you are assured that you will have someone from the opposite moiety offering uh, a, a, um, a similar uh, speech. 
cultural appropriation uh, emerged, the whole concept of cultural appropriation emerged in, uh, in academia uh, in the late 1970s and the 80s as part of the scholarly critique on colonialism. Uh, cultural appropriation has been defined as the flow of tangible and intangible cultural elements from, from indigenous societies into Western societies or predominantly Western societies. And so we have both tangible and intangible property that is being appropriated. Um, it, it, it's also a, a violation of intellectual property rights. Uh, a key factor in cultural appropriation relates to the power relationship between the expropriated and the expropriator. The imbalance of power between a minority culture and members of the dominant culture is more often a product, a byproduct of colonialism and oppression. Cultural appropriation has historically been, been done without regard to native values or what native people think about it. Uh, those of you living in Juneau might have might recall that earlier in this year, cultural appropriation became a highly debated issue uh, following the annual wearable arts show uh, where a Japanese inspired outfit was made by a non-Japanese uh, designer. Uh, I thought that the discussion, the debate that followed was healthy. Uh, there were a lot of high emotions about it. I know Jack did a great job in trying to address the issue, trying to resolve the issue. Um, they had speakers, they brought outside people in to talk about cultural appropriation. Um, I thought it was a healthy discussion, but unfortunately, uh, it left many without uh, uh, answering questions. And so, for example, we right after that debate, we had these teachers that we had taught, been having in our classes, teaching uh, Northwest Coast art. They were reluctant to teach uh, the art that we taught them because they saw it as cultural appropriation. I, tried to convince them, I said, no, it is not cultural appropriation because I am giving you the right, I am granting you this right, I am imploring you to teach this art uh, in schools. We want our children to, lo to learn it, we want others to learn uh, an appreciation of what North, uh, Northwest Coast art is. Uh, I don't know if I convinced him or not, but I'm hoping that other teachers that we are continuing to teach uh, will will pay heed and and continue uh, to teach the art that we are teaching them. We we at SHI have adopted a goal to promote cross cultural understanding, and um, and this is our effort. We want to teach non natives about our about our culture, and we want to have our culture and history and arts integrated into the schools. And uh, what's happening here is we see a shift from the historical colonialism that plagued our lives as native people. This, this now goal uh, implies a symmetry, a symmetrical power between the native and non-native society in which indigenous society acknowledges a right to teach non-natives about native culture and Northwest Coast art.